Welcome back to Downing Street for today's coronavirus briefing. Uh, before we start, I wanted to let you know that today's briefing will follow a bit of a new format. Following significant demand, as well as questions from the media, we'll take our first questions from a member of the public. This is going to become a regular feature of these briefings. Uh, the questions are selected by an independent polling organisation, and just like the journalist questions, um, we don't see the questions in advance, but we'll give them the very best answers that we can. In the past few hours since we announced this new approach, we've had over 15,000 questions submitted. And you can ask a question yourself by going to gov.uk forward slash ask. And today I'm joined by Professor Chris Whitty and Professor Steve Powis, the medical director of the NHS. The government is working through our action plan, and at its core, the objective is to protect life and to protect the NHS, both by slowing the spread of the virus so that we flatten the curve and by ensuring that the NHS always has more than enough capacity to provide critical care for all those who need it. According to the most recent figures, there have been 719,000 910 tests for coronavirus so far in the UK, including 37,024 yesterday. 157,149 people have tested positive. That's an increase of 4,310 cases since yesterday. 15,051 people are currently in hospital with coronavirus, down from 15,239 yesterday, and sadly, of those hospitalised with the virus, 21,092 have now died. That's an increase of 360 fatalities, and we must never lose sight of the human cost of coronavirus and the pain and the grief that it causes. And each death serves as a reminder that we must stand firm in our resolve. Sadly, these deaths figures include 82 NHS colleagues and 16 colleagues who work in social care. They dedicated their lives to caring for others. And I feel a deep personal sense of duty that we must care for their loved ones. Today, I'm able to announce that the government is setting up a life assurance scheme for NHS and social care frontline colleagues. Families of staff who die from coronavirus in the course of their essential frontline work will receive a £60,000 payment. Of course, nothing replaces the loss of a loved one. But we want, what, we want to do everything that we can to support families who are dealing with this grief. And as a government, we're looking closely at other professions that work on the front line against coronavirus who, don't, who also do not have access to such schemes to see where this may be required. This crisis has shown this country values so much our health and social care workers. And I want to pay tribute to the perseverance of the British public who, even this warm spring weekend, in their vast majority, did the right thing and stayed at home to protect the NHS. Thus far in this crisis, at every single hour of every single day, the NHS has always had the capacity to treat the people who need that treatment. I'm glad to be able to report that there are now 3,190 spare critical care beds Indeed, 42% of oxygen-supported beds in the NHS now lie empty. And in most parts of the country, the number of people in hospital with coronavirus is beginning to fall. One of the reasons NHS capacity has always exceeded need is because of our amazing programme of NHS Nightingale Hospitals. Today, I was proud to attend, virtually, the opening of the eighth of our 10 Nightingale hospitals across the UK, again built in a matter of weeks. This Nightingale hospital project 
stands as a monument to the nation's ability to get things done when it matters. This is one of the most ambitious projects this country has ever seen in peacetime. And I'd like to thank the NHS, the armed forces, and all the companies that have worked side by side to make these plans a reality. The Nightingale project is just one of the measures that's boosted capacity all across the NHS. By re-enlisting thousands of former staff, former clinicians, and enrolling early thousands of students, we've boosted the workforce of the NHS. And we've changed forever the digital capability of the NHS. I think many people who've now used online GP consultations and online outpatient visits won't ever go back. And I pay tribute to the staff who've worked in different ways to how they would ever have imagined and who've been more flexible and open to change when it was really needed. So where there have been advances amongst these huge challenges of this crisis, we must not lose them. However, we also know that fewer people are coming to the NHS when they need to. A&E attendances have dropped to 221,000 emergency department attendances in the last week, compared to 477,000 in the same week last year. That's more than 50%. Now, some of this drop is due to lower road traffic and people following the social distancing rules. Some of it will be due to people accessing the NHS in ways that work better for them, like online or through pharmacies, and that's a good thing. But in some cases, we know that the drop is due to people not coming forward and using the NHS for critical things that matter. Our message is that the NHS is open. Help us to help you. So if you're worried about chest pains, for instance, maybe you might be having a heart attack or a stroke, or you feel a lump and you're worried about cancer, or you're a parent concerned about your child, please come forward and seek help as you always would. It is so important that everybody uses the NHS responsibly and the NHS will always be there for you when you need it. Just as it's been there for us all throughout this crisis and throughout our lives. And as the number of hospitalizations from coronavirus begins to fall, I can announce that starting tomorrow, we'll begin the restoration of other NHS services starting with the most urgent, like cancer care and mental health support. The exact pace of the restoration will be determined by local circumstances on the ground, according to local need and according to the amount of coronavirus cases that the, that hospital is having to deal with. Having written off £13.4 billion worth of historic NHS debt, I want to ensure that the NHS is always there in a way that doesn't just help us recover from coronavirus as a country, but also puts us in a stronger position for the future. We're coming through this peak. We'll honour those who've dedicated their lives to caring for others. But it will count for nothing if we let things slip now and risk a second peak. I know that lockdown is hard for so many people, but let us all have the resolve to see this through. So please, stay at home, protect the NHS, and save lives. We're now going to go to Professor Chris Whitty, the Chief Medical Officer, for the daily data charts, and then we're going to take questions from the public. Uh, thank you very much, Secretary of State. Um, so just the first slide is just a reminder uh, to people uh, of the five tests for adjusting the lockdown. Um, the first three of which are about the epidemic, that the NHS has capacity to provide critical care across the UK, a sustained and consistent fall in the daily deaths over, overall uh, from coronavirus, uh, and the rate of infection decreased to manageable levels across the board. Then there's an operational uh, point about operational challenges, including testing and PPE in hand with uh, supply able to meet future demand. And then finally, and importantly, confident that the adjustments uh, to current measures will not risk a second peak of infections. Next slide, please. 
Uh, the next two slides are really uh, ways of uh, looking at whether people are continuing, as they have been consistently throughout this crisis, uh, to heed the guidance uh, in terms of uh, keeping pressure off the NHS by staying at home unless they have to go out for uh, necessary things. And as you can see, uh, after a very uh, remarkable fall initially, broadly this has been flat, very slight trending up in terms of motor vehicles, uh, but otherwise really the data remain uh, largely unchanged on these transport metrics. Next slide, please. And then looking at other uh, forms, the driving uh, we've talked about before, uh, a very slight increase in walking, uh, public transport remains largely flat. So uh, evidence, I think, that the great majority of people are continuing to honour the lockdown, which is helping us to drive the number of cases uh, down and therefore take pressure off the NHS. Next slide, please. Uh, the next uh, few slides are really ones that people who watch these uh, briefings will be very familiar with. It's just the most recent data. So new cases in the UK. Uh, as you can see, uh, obviously one thing we have to bear, bear in mind is the number of tests is going up overall. Uh, but uh, despite that, the trend is flat or slightly down in terms of uh, positive uh, cases. Next slide, please. But when we actually look at people in hospital, I think the trends that demonstrate that over the country as a whole, uh, we're going through the peak are reasonably clear to see. Uh, obviously a bigger fall in London, uh, but uh, the rest of the country in different areas, are either flat or decreasing over time. Next slide, please. And then when we turn to uh, one of the most important questions, which is critical care capacity, uh, if you look at these trends across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, uh, these are the percentage of all critical care beds being used for COVID patients. And both in absolute and in relative terms, uh, this is gradually trending down. But importantly, and I talked about this last time I was here, this is a very gradual peak. We're not seeing a dramatic fall off and nor do we expect, so, expect, expect to uh, in the next uh, short while. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, sadly, uh, people are continuing to die. Uh, as uh, we have said every time just after a weekend, uh, there's an artificial drop because there's less notification over weekends. So the number of cases uh, who uh, sadly were reported as having died yesterday was 360. I do actually expect there will be a bit of an uptick again uh, later in the week as we catch up from the weekend uh, drop. Nevertheless, the trend overall, as you can see from the seven-day rolling average at the top, uh, which smooths out these uh, weekend effects, is a gradual decline, uh, but we are definitely not consistently past the peak across the whole country at this point in time. Finally, a uh, slide which uh, compares uh, diff different countries and again I would be really clear that we should not overinterpret the absolute numbers the way these are actually measured in different countries is different but the trend lines uh, I think are, are reasonably clear from this thank you very much thank you very much uh, Chris and now we're going to go to the first question which is from Lynn in Skipton and I'm going to read out the question um, and I'm reading it for the first time and then we will endeavour to answer it. I'm missing my grandchildren so much. Please can you let me know if after the five criteria are met is being able to hug our closest family one of the first steps out of lockdown? Well thank you Lynn for that uh, question. An incredibly important one and brings home the emotional uh, impact of the lockdown measures. Um, I think why don't we take the direct medical evidence from the chief medical officer? Well, very clearly, for most people, um, uh, the ability to actually interact with families in a way that they have not been able to during this period is absolutely essential. Uh, in terms of the direct answer to uh, this lady's question, um, uh, it depends, if, if I'm honest, on the situation uh, that she finds herself in. So if she is someone who has a significant medical problem in a way that means that she would have to be shielding that is uh, and she's uh, an older uh, person some grandparents are, are younger grandparents some obviously are older uh, if she's in a group which is vulnerable 
then the answer is that it might well be prudent, and this will be depend entirely on individual circumstances, for her not to uh, get into a situation where she is putting herself at risk. Obviously, if she's healthy and younger, uh, that may well not be true. But the overall uh, view that actually one of the things that clearly is important to everybody is the ability to get together with families uh, remotely, but also physically, everyone fully accepts. Nevertheless, it is important that people who are vulnerable continue to be protected, even after whatever the next steps are occur. Thank you. And I, uh, the thing I'd say um, to Lynn directly is that uh, we understand the impact of uh, not being able to hug your closest family. Um, it affects all of us too, as well as the direct uh, health impacts of the lockdown, uh, bringing down the, the curve and trying to stop this terrible disease, uh, and also the economic impacts, which are clearly very significant. Um, there are also the direct uh, emotional bonds, because it's one of the most natural things in the world to want to hug a member of your, um, a member of your family. Uh, and we just hope we can get back to that as soon as possible. And the best way we can get there fastest is for people to follow the, the rules so we can get those five criteria met as soon as possible. I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Only to add that we all know how hard this is. Um, my own mother lives hundreds of miles away and I know she's wondering when she'll be seeing me and, and her grandchildren again. Uh, this is really tough, but as the Secretary of State has said, uh, it is bearing fruit in that we are seeing reduction in the number of hospital admissions, we're seeing a reduction in the number of deaths, uh, and it's only by the British public continuing to comply with that guidance until the time is right uh, that uh, we will all continue uh, to see a reduction uh, in deaths, which I know has touched so many people around the country in terms of loved ones. Thank you very much, Lynn, for your uh, question. Um, and. Um uh, for submitting it, and I hope that, um, I think that's shown, that the uh, questions from the member, members of the public can be uh, are just as informative and can be um, uh, you know, just as difficult to answer as members, as questions from um, journalists who are trained to ask them. Talking of which, Hugh Pym from the BBC. Thank you very much. Question for the Secretary of State. It's about testing, particularly important in the short term at least, for up to 10 million key workers and their families. We're hearing varying reports on how easy it might be or not to book tests online. What do you say to that? And do you think you will hit your target of 100,000 tests a day by the end of this month? That's later this week. Well, um, thank you. I think we are on track to the, um, to the 100,000 target. We're broadly where we expected to be. Uh, you've seen a big increase over the weekend to 37,000 tests um, yesterday. Um, now, we are also enhancing and making it easier to access how you get a hold of tests. The home tests have been particularly uh, popular. Um, we delivered uh, 5,681 of those yesterday. Um, and um, I, that, that is all about being able to make the testing as easy for people who, if you've got symptoms, you're by the nature of the thing, you are already ill, uh, and so we want to make it as easy as possible to get hold of uh, those tests. Alongside it, still we're opening more and more uh, drive-through centres. So we're broadly where we expected to be, um, and we've got uh, a lot of work the rest of this week to keep continuing the ramp up to the goal that I so clearly set out. Thanks, Hugh. Can I ask a follow-up? Yes, of course. Uh, beyond this, it's very important to escalate testing capacity significantly uh, to prevent or help prevent a second spike. Where do you want to be with yeah. capacity and testing ability in a few months' time? How you, many, how many thousands, hundreds of thousands a day? So this is a, this is a really important question. And of course, you know, the reason that I set the goal and that we're working so hard towards it is because testing is an important part of how we keep the spread of the virus down, um, especially once we've got the, the, the number of new cases down through the social distancing measures. Um, so we want testing to continue to, uh, continue to increase. As you'll know, the Prime Minister set a, a goal of 250,000 some time ago, uh, for, especially for when the antibody tests um, come on stream, but 
so far, um, there isn't one of those that is clinically um, uh, valid. Um, the, um, so, so we'll keep on increasing. Uh, it's important to note that we've already gone past the number of tests per day, for instance, that they carry out in um, South Korea. Um, we're approaching the levels that, uh, that Germany undertakes. So you know, this is a, it's a project to keep in increasing. Also, we need to think very hard and take the clinical advice on, um, on how to use those tests. For instance, we're putting far more into, um, into care homes. Um, we're making sure that now NHS staff get tested, including when they're asymptomatic, to make sure that we understand whether, whether people who are working in hospitals have got the virus. Uh, and using the tests for surveys, um, the Office for National Statistics have got a survey, for instance, in the field right now uh, with people being tested uh, this week to find out how many people have got the virus, how many have had the virus, the critical questions that we need to know the, uh, the, the answers to. So I don't know if you want to add um, the, the, anything, Chris, but the point is it, it's a really important question because, the, 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 because testing is a critical part of controlling the virus uh, once we get the number of new cases down. Only thing to add is that the more testing capacity you've got, the, the more flexibility you have to do different things, which both for patients and uh, in terms of uh, things like care homes, as the Secretary of State was saying. Thanks, Hugh. Robert Peston, ITV. Uh, good afternoon. Um, on the uh, life insurance scheme, will overseas healthcare workers working in the NHS and those who've come back to the NHS uh, temporarily, will they qualify for this life insurance? Right now, they don't, for example, qualify for normal death in service benefits. And a question, I think, largely for Chris Whitty. Um, more or less, the most important test you've set is that the transmission rate, the so-called R, has to fall to 0.5. So, you know, in language you can all understand, on average, it would take two infected people to infect one other person. What's the magic of that 0.5? Why does it give you comfort? And also, since we still don't know how many people are walking around with funny symptoms or no symptoms of the, at all who have the virus, how can you be remotely confident you know, that you will get there. Neil Ferguson said he thinks that the number is currently 0 0.6 to 0 0.7, but how can we possibly be confident of that? I'll take the first um, question, uh, Robert. The answer is um, yes, this is for frontline staff uh, working in the NHS and in social care um, who, who die uh, as, um, and, our, and our employees within the uh, NHS and social care and as I say we're also looking at um, which other groups of key workers that applies to um, who don't have a scheme already in place. Chris. Uh, on uh, 0.5 uh, can I just correct I mean I I don't recall ever saying that the target was 0.5 uh, what I have said is that it's in the range 0.5 to 1 at the present time probably somewhere in the middle of that range and the second thing which I have said uh, is that it is really important we do not go above one that one is an absolute target, and the reason for that is that once it goes above one for any prolonged period of time, I mean, you might just flick up for a short period, then you go back to exponential growth, uh, and then uh, short, sooner or later, depending on how much above one it is, you get back to the situation the NHS is threatened to be overwhelmed because exponential growth goes from very small numbers to very large numbers very fast. So I would like to clarify that it's a, not going above one is the long-term target. Clearly, the, short, the lower we can get it at the moment, uh, the better. But as I say, it's probably in the middle of the range, 0.5 to 1 at the present, and that is bringing down uh, the R, which is what you're actually seeing when you look at the uh, critical care and uh, other metrics we looked at in the slides. Thanks very I mean, much. Could I just, yeah, could I just of course. One, one, one extra thing, actually, just on the on the life insurance. And just to be clear, there's nothing in this life insurance scheme that would waive the rights of uh, the families of individuals uh, who uh, get COVID and, and uh, you know either die or are, or are seriously injured from in a sense, suing the, the NHS in the traditional way if they feel they haven't been properly protected, particularly in the absence they, they might feel of appropriate PPE gear. There's no, there's no waiving of their, their standard employment rights involved in any of this. Uh, no. Uh, Beth Rigby from Sky. 
Thank you. Uh, Professor Whitty, at the beginning of the lockdown, Sir Patrick suggested a death toll be below 20,000 was a good outcome. Now hospital deaths are sadly above 21,000, and that doesn't even include care home or community deaths. How have you had to change your expectations as the disease has progressed? And can you provide an updated expectation of what you think a more realistic number is now? Uh, and Secretary of State, you've promised 100,000 tests by Thursday. And last week you said trace track uh, and tr tr taste, tr sorry, trace and track was key to easing social distancing measures. What level of testing do you need to get track and trace up and running? And what's your time frame for that? Yeah. Um, go ahead. Uh, so on the, fir on the first one, um, uh, the number will definitely exceed 20,000. Uh, so even with hospital deaths, as you say, sadly it has gone above that. Uh, once we look into direct and indirect, and I constantly make this point, but it is really important, direct and indirect deaths all cause mortality. Uh, we definitely, sadly, do expect it to exceed that. I think that uh, my view actually is we need to view this uh, epidemic over the long run, uh, and this has got a very long way to run. Uh, and um, I'm really cautious about putting out, and I've said this again repeatedly, these kind of absolute numbers, because this could go in a lot of different ways over the next uh, many months until such time as we have a clear exit that has a vaccine or drugs or some other route that allows us to be able to say, look, we now can stop people uh, dying from this. And this is going to be true, uh, to be clear, in every country around the world. So I'm, I'm really cautious about putting these absolute numbers, but I am absolutely clear also that the 20,000 number is, is not where we will be once we add in the direct and indirect causes both in and out of hospital. Um, and on the question on test, track and trace, uh, it's all a matter of degree. Um, and um, the, 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 the lower the number of new cases, the more effective a system of test, track and trace of any scale is. Um, and therefore, 100,000 tests a day is a big enough testing system um, to start test, track and trace. But if it's bigger, then the system can work um, on a higher number of cases and be more effective. South Korea is a really good example where they peaked in terms of tests a day at just over 20,000, and they've now brought that down because their number of new cases is so much lower. Um, they can test everywhere they want, and they still don't need to use up all of the tests that they have the capacity for. Um, and we've seen over the last few weeks the, the gaps between capacity uh, and the number of tests done in this country as well. And I noted, uh, you know, on, um, on Sunday, the new German ambassador to the UK was explaining um, that there's a, um, the number of tests, the test capacity in Germany is 800,000 a week, um, and own, they use 450,000 uh, of that capacity each week. So we have a similar pattern of, the, of capacity being higher than tests used all around the world. Um, and um, the capacity that we're building is, is, is big enough to get started on test, track, and trace. We need to um, uh, get the, uh, the, 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 the track and the trace part of that up and running so that they can be effective as we bring the number of new cases down. And can, I just, can I just follow up just on one thing? Professor Whitty, just, just quickly, what, what explains the mismatch between where you thought the death toll would be at the beginning of the lockdown uh, and where we are ending up at uh, a month in. What, what, what changed over the course of the past few weeks? Um, I've never put an absolute number into the public domain. I've been asked this lots of times. My aim has always been to try and get the number to be the minimum we can, we can manage. But to be clear, this has got a very long way to run. Uh, and I think just thinking about the first peak, which due to the fantastic work the whole nation has done and the work of the NHS, we have actually managed to go through. We've still got some way before it's falling right off, but there is a long, long way to go beyond that. And I think it's a big mistake, in my view, just to uh, consider just the first phase. We need to look at the epidemic as a whole. Thanks very much, Beth. Uh, Gary Gibbon Thanks. from Channel 4. Uh, Professor Whitty, could I follow up on Robert, what Robert Peston was asking about uh, on the infection rates if we are in the middle of the 0.5 to 1 range will that do 
is that good enough? Or is it actually the, the, the rate that you need to give clearance to a relaxation uh, of the rules is lower than that, is perhaps around 0.5? Uh, well, <clears throat> I think there are, I mean, clearly the lower the R, and just to remind people who don't watch this program the whole time, this is if, if R is 1, one person gives it to one person and the disease is stable. If R is 0.5, 10 people give it to 5 and so on, it's going down. And if it's 2, one person gives it to 2, gives it to 4 and so on. Just, that was just a clarification for people watching. Um, the further away the R is from 1 and on, on the downside, so the, the closer it is, well, the lower it is, the better, for two reasons. The first of which uh, is that it will m mean that the, uh, the peak will fall away faster uh, and will get down to small numbers at a quicker rate. That's a good thing, clearly. But the second thing is the, the larger the gap between where the R is, the current force of transmission, and 1, the greater room for manoeuvre there is in term, terms of trying to think through when ministers have to look at things uh, in terms of what could be reintroduced without threatening the risk that we could go back above one and start going back to, to uh, exponential growth. So um, we know what we've currently measured indirectly, but I think that there's a reasonable uh, degree of confidence that it's in that, that broader range, 0.5 to 1, and I think it's probably in a rather narrow range in the middle of that. Uh, obviously, if it was lower, that would give us more room for manoeuvre, but it gives some room for manoeuvre, but it doesn't give a huge amount of room for manoeuvre. And that's one of the things that we ministers are going to have to consider, is how to actually uh, make sure we keep the R below 1, uh, given where we are at the moment, thanks to what everybody is doing. But, you know, there isn't a, a magic number here. Lower is better, but uh, it's not that there is a specific number that has to be the right number. May I ask a quick supplementary? What's, what's your current estimate of what r naught is measuring in hospitals and care homes? Uh, I think at the moment it's quite difficult, and um, it's quite difficult to separate those two out. Uh, my expectation is that you do, well, I, it is very clear it is falling in hospitals. Uh, where it is in terms of care homes, I think, is less easy to work out at this point. We've got ONS data coming out tomorrow, which may help a bit, but we're not measuring that directly, I have to say. And what I think we're seeing across the country is some care homes where there are significant outbreaks and other care homes which are unaffected. They're not kind of, it's not, a, it's not like the community are, which is much more heavily influenced by the whole of the population. It's much more local to particular areas and particular care homes. And maybe Steve could answer yeah, on the so, NHS so, point. So in hospitals, it's clear that the number of people who are testing positive in hospitals is falling, uh, and therefore infection rates uh, are falling. We would expect that because we are now in a position where the community spread of the virus is less, and therefore that will translate into lower spread uh, in people coming into hospital and therefore in hospitals as well. Um, as Chris said, I think care homes think differently um, in terms of approach to that, but in hospitals it's clear that uh, the infection rate is falling. Thanks very much, Gary. Uh, Sebastian Payne of the FT. Thank you very much, Mr Hancock. Um, there were reports over the weekend that in the second phase of fighting the coronavirus, the government is planning to quarantine people arriving in the UK for 14 days. I was wondering what changed your mind about tighter border restrictions, and does that mean you're going to be encouraging British families to holiday at home this year? And if I can ask a question for Professor Whitty, could you give us an update on antibody testing, please, and whether the government has seen any breakthrough in its assessments for those tests? Um, thanks very much. Um, I, um, on, on the borders, we've been very clear that we follow the science, and given the current level of infections, uh, level of new cases in the UK, um, and the very low amounts of international travel that's going, uh, going on right now, it is clear that the impact on the epidemic as a whole of the number of people coming through the borders um, as a proportion is very low. But as we bring the number of new cases down in the UK, uh, that proportion uh, coming from those who are travelling internationally uh, will rise. And that means that the, that the judgment on the measures that you need at the border changes. And we've seen a number of countries go through this uh, process um, and um, we'll have more to say about it in due course. Uh, on the testing point, I don't know whether you want to uh, go into that, but there's, there's a, the antibody tests is still something that we 
uh, work on. We have now lab-based antibody tests. Uh, in fact, in the field now, this, the uh, Office for National Statistics Survey is based on lab-based antibody tests. Um, but we're uh, yet to find a what's called a lateral flow, which means a, a test you can, uh, you can take. You don't need to send a sample to a lab because it gives you the result on the stick. stick. We're yet to find one that has a clinical uh, level of, uh, of, of, um, uh, uh, of results that we're confident in. I mean, so my, my view is that science very seldom uh, moves forward by breakthroughs. It moves forward by small incremental changes that over time significantly improve things. That is what I think will happen with this antibody test. We currently have tests that are good enough uh, to give us a first pass at a ranging shot on surveys to give us a feel for how many people in the community uh, overall uh, may have been infected, some of them without knowing it because uh, there's, there's certainly some uh, transmission without people actually getting symptoms. But an antibody test that is good enough actually to be able to say to an individual, we're confident either yes, you've had it, or we're confident no, you have not. We have not yet got to that stage, and I think it's unlikely to happen in a single leap. It's likely to happen in a series of small improvements that get us to a point uh, where we feel sufficient confidence we can do that. Thank you. Mr. Hancock, could I just ask a follow-up, please? Sure. Um, you mentioned earlier you were encouraging people that if they've got heart pains or are worried about serious illness to go to hospital. Has the government done any work to measure some of the health side effects of the lockdown, such as its impact on mental health or domestic violence? And will that play any part in your decision on how to ease the lockdown measures? Uh, Thank you. Yes, we have. And um, one of the striking things around the world um, is that far fewer people are coming forward to use health services, uh, including, the, uh, including here, um, far fewer people are coming forward to use non-COVID services in the NHS. Um, I'll ask um, Professor Powis to, uh, to elaborate because he's been doing a lot of the work on this. Yes, so Secretary of State said, and as, as Chris said earlier, uh, one of the things that we have concerns around are the indirect deaths, i.e. deaths and harm, that is not related specifically to infection with COVID-19. Uh, and that's why for some weeks now, we've all been reminding everybody uh, that if you do have uh, a condition which might be a heart attack, chest pain, symptoms that might be a stroke, then don't forget that the NHS is still there for you. The emergency services are there and always have been there through, throughout this. Uh, and also these are conditions where it's important not to wait because treatment diagnosis and treatment uh, speed is of the essence and, and we can do many things for those conditions now but we need to do it quickly uh, so the message to the public is come forward uh, the NHS is working uh, if you have a sick child if you have those symptoms uh, I think in the long term we will only be able to tease this out as we start to look at excess deaths uh, overall uh, Chris has mentioned that uh, I think earlier today uh, and of course comparisons between countries in terms of excess uh, deaths will be important as well uh, but we do know that attendances in A&E department are down uh, there's reasons that that might be the case but there are reasons uh, why people why we want to encourage people to come forward if they have uh, emergency uh, uh, symptoms that might uh, might need emergency uh, treatment so I think it will become clearer over time but the key message for the public is the NHS is there for you. Uh, come forward as you always would if you've got symptoms uh, or one of your loved ones has got symptoms that might need emergency treatment. Thanks very much, Seb. Uh, Gordon Rayner from The Telegraph. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Secretary of State. Uh, Professor, Professor Whitty, you, you said in March that children uh, only got mild symptoms uh, of coronavirus, which you said was a silver lining. Uh, while Sir Patrick Balance said closing schools would have a minimal effect on the spread of the virus, so it was safe to keep them open, uh, and there was zero chance of children avoiding contact with each other anyway. Uh, to what extent has your advice on sending children to school changed? Um, have you worked out the effect on the R value of sending children back to school? Um, and also, do you believe that children can spread coronavirus to other children? Uh, following reports at the weekend that, uh, that perhaps they couldn't. And just very quickly, Secretary of State, you've just announced good news for a lot of people that hospitals are going to start taking in cancer patients and doing other non-emergency work. Um, can you give us more detail on that? And, and would people be watching this be wrong to interpret that as the start of an easing of the lockdown? 
Uh, Chris, do you want to take the first one, and then I'll ask Steve to comment on yeah, it. So, so um, it remains the case that the great majority of children uh, either don't get coronavirus, or if they do, the symptoms are minor. That doesn't mean, sadly, that that is absolutely true. There are still a small number of uh, cases, including some very severe cases, but they are relative to adults, much less than than uh, than, uh, than they are, they're much less than adults. So that's that's that remains absolutely the case. So the first reason for not sending children to school, which is it's particularly dangerous for them, that wouldn't be true in the case of coronavirus. Uh, there is, secondly, there is no doubt that they contribute. Uh, if you have schools open, it does contribute to increasing the R. So if you close schools, the R goes down. It's part of the collection of things that were done uh, in March to try and pull the R from where it was near three to where it is now uh, below one. Uh, it's not. It's only one of, if you did it just on its own, it wouldn't be enough. But if you stop doing it, uh, you would actually lose some of the benefit that we've currently got. Now, there is a, quite a debate at the moment around the world in science. What contribution do children make to the actual spread of this virus between families uh, uh, around the country, wherever we're talking about? Uh, and is it different, for example, between young children and older children, which it may be? But unfortunately, we do not yet have direct data that really help us. Remembering that this is a new disease, so we can give a reasonably accurate answer for a disease like flu. We really understand how children uh, help drive flu. We are still really learning on this one. And so whilst I think it remains the case that we think that the, uh, the contribution of children at school to the, uh, to the spread of this virus is probably less than, for example, for flu, we do think it certainly contributes, and what we're trying to work at is what proportion of the R it contributes, and therefore, if children went back to school, how much closer to one, and that's in a bad way, uh, would we be, uh, and could it even tip us above one, and how, what can we do, if so, to try and minimise that? So it's a, it's, a very, it's a very good question to which there is unfortunately not a really clear answer, but we are getting closer, I think, to having a slightly narrower range of uncertainty uh, around, around this. Uh, thanks, Chris. On the restoration of the NHS, we've always said throughout that people should come forward for medical treatment. Um, so people's access to the NHS, access to medical treatment, has never been uh, locked down. Indeed, it's one of the four reasons um, that you should um, leave your uh, house if you need to. Um, and what we can do, though, is because we now have the capacity in the NHS to be able to start uh, reopening some services, um, we can do that. And I'll ask Chris, uh, uh, Steve to um, answer the question about uh, with more detail, but it will be locally determined according to what capacity there is locally. Uh, but our message to people watching this and reading the Daily Telegraph is that the NHS is open and there to help you as it always is. And so people, if, should, if they think they need um, medical treatment from the NHS, then they should come forward in the first instance uh, by phoning up their GP or going to their GP online, calling 111. Yes, yeah, so as the Secretary of State said, uh, we are now in a position uh, to, re, um, to, to start undertaking some of the services that we may have had to have uh, stepped down to manage the surge in coronaviruses or, or occasionally where services have become disrupted. Uh, so, for instance, I know uh, cancer patients, there may be good clinical reasons why treatment might be delayed during a time when there is a lot of circulating uh, virus in the community. Uh, and, and again, as we uh, both said, emergency services have been there all along and it's really important that people access them. But I think to answer your question directly, it's, it's not at all uh, a sign that the lockdown uh, is about to be relaxed. In fact, I think it's the reverse. It's a sign that the lockdown and the measures that have been taken and the fact that everybody's following them has meant that we are now seeing a decline in patients uh, in hospital with COVID-19. COVID and it's exactly that is that, that is providing the capacity once again that means that we can get back to restarting services such as elective uh, surgery. Uh, so um, I think the message shouldn't be now is the time to relax. The message should be that by continuing to comply with these instructions, 
uh, it will continue to help the NHS as we, we start to get over the peak and the, the plateaus uh, to a point where we can get much more back to the services that uh, unfortunately we've had to delay over the last few weeks as we've uh, managed this surge. Can I just ask a quick Of course, quick yeah. Uh, just, just on the schools question, I mean, listening to that answer that, that Professor Whitty gave, a lot of people, I think, listening to this would interpret that as meaning that there still isn't really a, a plan in place for how schools are going to go back. Um, would it be wrong to, to infer that from what you're saying? Well, uh, Chris, I, I, I'll just say, what I'd say is it's, it, it's still, as we've said over and over again, too early to make... Um, decisions on this and people should follow the social gis distancing rules of staying at home to protect the NHS and save lives and in a way what we've been saying today about the restarting of many um, of, of hospital treatments uh, NHS treatments and the encouragement of many people to come forward um, when they haven't been coming forward uh, with non-COVID health problems is all part of protecting the NHS, which has been made possible by the fact that the, um, uh, the, the, we've flattened the curve uh, thanks to the social distancing measures. Uh, so it should be seen in that light and that um, context. But on the school specifically, Chris, do you want to answer? So I think, I mean, making the starting with the obvious point that obviously the final decisions will be for ministers and not, you know, this is not a scientific uh, decision. But what we can contribute from the science side is to say, well, look, um, we've got this room for manoeuvre between where the R is now and one. And there's a lot of things that are contributing, which everyone's doing, to pulling that down. Uh, schools are contributing some of that. Uh, and it may be different between different bits of schools. And what we're trying to do, at, you know, very, very, in short, very, very short order, is try and give a kind of feel for what are the combinations of different things which actually still keep the R below one, which is an absolutely critical thing, but allow opening up of different bits of, of, uh, of society and different bits of which schools is one. But I, I think the decision about how the different combinations go together, that finally is one for ministers. And I, I, I know the Secretary of State would completely agree with that. What we can do is help provide some, some data to help say, here are some combinations of things we can do. But, and I really want to be clear about this, there is no perfect solution where we're going to end up being able to do all the things that people want and at the same time keep R below one. So there are going to have to be some very difficult choices between different things, all of which, ideally all of us would love to open up, but we can't do them all. And therefore, there will have to be some difficult choices and choices around schools clearly will be one of those. Is that okay, Gordon? Yes, thank you. Great. Uh, we've got uh, David Walsh from the Sheffield Star. Hello, Secretary of State. Um, the Raise the Bar campaign wants to increase the threshold for the £25,000 retail hospitality and leisure grant from £51,000 raisable value to £150,000. In Sheffield City Centre, this would mean a further 157 businesses could benefit from additional £3.9 million of support. This would save businesses and jobs. Can this be actioned? And a second one for the Secretary of State, please. Sheffield is famous for its independent breweries. It has more per capita than anywhere in the country and was enjoying a golden age prior to the crisis. The government support grants have bought them time, but with no opening date yet for pubs and bars, their very existence is under threat. To get them back on their feet, will the government cancel beer duty for six months when they're allowed to restart operations? Uh, well, thanks, David. I, I, I understand, especially coming from a small business background myself, just how important these questions are to the businesses in the centre of Sheffield and the breweries, which have, as you say, been flourishing right across the country um, over the past few years. Um, and, the, um, and, and have obviously been very hard hit by um, social distancing by its nature, uh, which, um, which takes away the ability to uh, go for a pint with friends. So I will take these away and talk to the Chancellor about them. What I would say is his announcement today of 100% guaranteed loans for smaller businesses is a, another important step in supporting businesses to get through this. We recognise 
the, the importance of, of supporting businesses right across the board, um, whether they're in a town centre, breweries or, or others who are badly hit by this. Um, the, supporting businesses through it is critical because both the health uh, impact of the measures and the economic impact are both best served by people um, staying at home because that saves lives but we'll also get the rate of transmission down as fast as possible uh, which will then allow us to get through this as soon as possible. Um, so we want to get through it as soon as possible and we want to support businesses on the way through and those two specific ideas um, I, it's tempting to um, say yes to uh, as health secretary uh, but uh, I think the, the I need to talk to the Chancellor. Thanks very much. Um, Dave West from the HSJ. <coughs> Hi, thank you. Um, so, uh, first question for uh, Mr Hancock. Um, could you tell us a bit more about the restoration of services, um, general plan services in the NHS? Um, there are millions of uh, people on the waiting list for general operations or appointments, hip replacements or cataracts and things. When would you expect, uh, what sort of time frame would you expect that kind of general um, activity to be getting back to normal? Might it be region by region? And what role do those um, Nightingale hospitals have that, uh, to play in that, which you mentioned? And um, a second, second question, if I can, for um, Chris or Stephen. This morning, uh, HSJ revealed the warning to doctors about the small numbers of children who are becoming seriously ill um, with an unusual set of symptoms. Um, which the experts believe may be an emerging symptom linked to coronavirus. Do you think this may be a new feature of, of the outbreak, or are you um, pretty confident that these are simply cases of the small, uh, very small number of serious cases of coronavirus, which we do see in children? Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm very worried about the latter, and I'm, we are looking into it closely. I'll ask Steve to answer on that. On the restoration, this will be a locally driven approach, um, system by system. Um, the... Um, of course, the principles are that the most urgent treatment um, should be brought back first, um, and also um, that it needs to be according to uh, to the local demands on the system. You know, there's parts of the country where the number of COVID patients as a proportion is much lower than in other parts, um, and so um, it has to be locally driven. Uh, that means, unfortunately, I can't give you a sort of concrete single uh, number answer to when. Um, and it, it, is, it, is, it is gradually over weeks, uh, but um, starting from tomorrow. Steve? Yes, uh, thanks, Dave. Yes, so uh, as you've uh, referred to, we have become aware in the last few days uh, of reports of severe illness in children, which might be a Kawasaki-like disease. So Kawasaki disease is a very rare inflammatory condition that occurs in children. Uh, the, the cause is, is, is not often known. Uh, it can be related to a number of things. Uh, so uh, it's only in the last uh, few days, as I say, that we've seen those reports. And I know you, uh, you reported that in the, in the Health Service Journal uh, this morning. Uh, so both Chris and I uh, are aware of that. We have asked our experts, so I've asked the National Clinical Director for Children and Young People to look into this as a matter of urgency. I know the Secretary of State is concerned, as he said. I know Public Health England are also looking into this. So, so it's obviously important that when clinicians uh, see these cases and, and worry that there might be a cluster, uh, that they alert other clinicians so that we can make sure that they are identified if they're occurring elsewhere. Uh, and then... And then quite rightly, we ask our experts uh, to look into them and to see whether they can establish any link. We, we're not sure at the moment. It's, it's really too early to say whether there is a link. Uh, but what I should say, uh, as we said uh, already this afternoon, is our advice to parents is that these are, this sort of disease is very, very rare. Uh, if you are worried about a child who is becoming sick and not recovering, then do remember to contact 111 talk to GP or an emergency contact 999 because the emergency services in the NHS are there for sick children and it's important for this and other conditions uh, although although very rare I must emphasize rare uh, that you come forward uh, to seek uh, treatment uh, and diagnosis as quickly as possible. Thanks Steve. Chris Whitton. No, I'm just ready to reinforce what Steve said this is a very rare situation but I think it is entirely plausible that this is caused by this virus, at least in some cases, uh, because we know that in adults, who of course have much more uh, disease than children do, 
there's an, the, the big problems are caused by an inflammatory process, and this looks uh, rather like an inflammatory process, a rather different one. But therefore, given that we've got a new presentation of this at a time with a new disease, it, the possibility, it's not definite, we need to look for other causes as well, but the possibility that there is a link is certainly plausible. But back to Steve's overriding point, numbers are very small. Key thing is, if parents are worried, uh, then phone up and uh, get advice. Uh, it's very rare. Ask a very quick follow-up on the restoration. Yes. Um, the, the, the NHS needed to uh, free up about 30,000 beds to ensure it was um, ready to deal with the first peak and, um, and has been able to do so, but has used a lot of capacity and, and that's rearranged a lot of things. How many will it, is it going to need to keep open in case of a second peak or, or other uh, returns of the virus? Uh, because that's clearly going to be a big constraining factor um, along with the staff who staff the beds on what it can get do back to normal. Well, one of the principles of the um, tests we've set before we make any adjustments to the social distancing measures is that we shouldn't risk a second peak um, n n for many, many reasons, the direct impact, of course, but also because a second peak uh, would mean that we would have to uh, halt the restoration of the NHS for non-COVID treatments. Um, and that has an, an impact itself uh, on the health of the nation as as Chris Whitty first set out several weeks ago um, in terms of the indirect uh, death rate. Um, so we've got to make sure that we don't have that second peak. Um, therefore, the NHS is, um, of course, um, making sure that it can reopen um, where that locally uh, is appropriate given the local uh, amount of pressure on the, on the system, and also taking into account the Nightingale hospitals. In fact, I'm going to answer a question that was asked previously, uh, but um, by Beth Rigby, I think, but I didn't answer, which is that the Nightingales are not going to be used for, um, for non-coronavirus purposes because they are precisely set up and designed to deal with people who are intubated and are, um, uh, and are, and are sedated. Um, and, but, it, but the fact that they're there does help us to restore more of the core NHS uh, and, uh, and get that going as much as possible. Uh, did you want, were you coming in again? I was just going to say, very finally, would you see them all, the Nightingale hospitals, all seven, or the, I think it's seven or eight now, would to be used in that way? Um, in, the, um, in the first instance, yes, but, at, but as we go through this, we always keep things like this open to review, to work out what's the best way to use the, re the resources at the nation's disposal. Steve? Yes, so I think the Nightingales in specifically have been a very important part of the flexibility that the NHS has put in place to manage the surge. Remember, it's only a few weeks ago uh, that we were really concerned that we would see a surge uh, in patients, particularly those that needed critical care, that would go beyond even the surge capacity we could put in place in our existing critical care facilities by surging into theatres and recovery areas. So, so the Nightingales, I think, are, are a real proof uh, that the NHS can be agile and flexible and can change its model of care in a very short period of time. Um, clearly, we want to keep them there because at the, although the peak is, is reducing, we still feel that we, we need to have them there as the insurance policy that, uh, for COVID patients. Uh, but as we go forward, we will be keeping them under review, as the Secretary of State has, has said. And, and of course, we're only into the first week or so of coming off a plateau in a peak. And as you would expect, all that work, again, as the Secretary of State has, has indicated, uh, is being done at the moment to plan capacity going forward. And the restoration of services is a really important part of that, which I'm absolutely sure will occur hospital by hospital and region by region because infection rates are a bit different everywhere uh, and because different organisations have stepped up to manage the surge in, in, in slightly different ways. Uh, but the key point is that we are now in a position to bring those services increasingly uh, back on stream. If you'd asked me a month ago, Dave, that whether we would be having this discussion now about the restoration of those parts of the NHS that we had to um, pause um, in order to put capacity towards treating coronavirus. Uh, and the question is, how much NHS capacity do we need to keep in hand uh, in case there's a, um, there's a second um, outbreak, which we, you know, we don't want to risk? Um, the, uh, I would be, you know, that, 
I would uh, and that the NHS had not in the meantime been at all uh, uh, overtopped by demand in any instance, then I think uh, we'd be, um, if, you'd give, if you told me that a month ago, I would be very pleased with where we've come to on the NHS capacity um, because, um, because that is absolutely core to the principles of this country is that if you need NHS treatment, then you get it. Uh, and we've managed to keep that principle uh, throughout this, this, this vast crisis. Okay, thank you very much indeed. That concludes our uh, Downing Street briefing for today.